wherever you are. It's my greatest pleasure to welcome you all to this year's edition of the Progressive Governance Summit, the PGS 2021. The PGS brings together thought leaders, academics and activists with leading policymakers. During the upcoming days, the Progressive family will debate the political agenda, including green, social democratic, left and liberal perspectives from across Europe and North America. We want to find answers to the following questions. How can progressives make the 2020s a decade of progress? Hardly ever before has the pressure on political decision makers been higher as at the beginning of this decade. And hardly ever before have the challenges been greater. The end of the fossil fuel era, era the rise of China and the emergence of illiberal and populist forces worldwide that challenge the model of liberal democracy. The digitalization of all areas of life new global cooperation that challenged the responsibilities of the state and the fight against economic inequalities and deadly global diseases. Those challenges are obviously immense. But immense seems also the current momentum for change and the desire for a new style of politics across many Western societies. This momentum is inspired not least by North America with two progressive leaders Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau, who could also boost the center-left in Europe. Let's take the US case. In his first address to Congress, Joe Biden gave this important speech where he announced that America is on the move again. He mapped out a social and economic reform agenda by simply saying this remarkable sentence, and I quote, trickle-down economics has never worked, and it's time to grow the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. If the new Biden-Harris administration is about to walk the talk, this would mean a profound renewal, not only for the US, but also for the transatlantic relations and the progressive agenda on a global scale. How might this become reality? One current example from last weekend. The finance ministers from the Group of Seven, the so-called G7, reached an agreement backing the creation of a global minimum corporate tax rate of at least 15%. Much still needs to be ironed out with the following weeks and months, but in the best case, this agreement marks a breakthrough that could end a 30-year global race to the bottom on corporate tax rates. It could mark a tremendous achievement in and for progressive politics worldwide. As you know, the next G7 meeting in the UK will be held at the upcoming weekend. Let's use this PGS as platform to discuss all the important issues on the agenda, economic recovery, future prosperity, climate change, and the championing of shared values. So for progressives, now seems to be the right moment to come together. I'm very excited about today's kickoff. The opening of this year's summit is divided into two parts. In a few minutes, we will start with a scene setting introduction featuring Jeff Mulgan and the summit paper on how the 2020s can become a progressive decade. As Jeff Morgan wrote in his paper, we need to renew the central idea of being progressive. The view that the best years lie ahead, not behind. And to turn this belief into action, according to Jeff, we need to forge plural alliances, plural and also pluralistic alliances within and between our society and for him and for us, the future of politics. This input sets the ground for the second part of the opening, starting in about an hour, having a leaders panel featuring the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, the Vice Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, the former Prime Minister of Denmark and member of the Circle of Friends of das Progressive Zentrum, Helle Thorning Schmidt, as well as the thought leading innovation expert, Francesca Bria. I wish you all three inspiring summer days. Having said that, I now hand over to Karen, who will chair the first part. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I am delighted to chair this panel. The next uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, we will have a discussion around Jeff Mulgan's Summit Action paper, where he tries to answer, as we just heard, how the 2020s can become a progressive decade. But first, let me uh, introduce the panelists a bit more uh, properly. 
So Jeff Mulgan is the Professor of Collective Intelligence, Public Policy and Social Innovation at University College London. He's a former Chief Executive of Nesta, and last year he joined Demos Helsinki. He has a background as Director of the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit in the UK, and also as Director of Policy under British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Um, the panel also consists of Dr. Janka Ortel, the Director of the Asia Programme at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, she pr previously worked as a senior fellow in the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund, where she focused on transatlantic China policy. And my name is Karin Pettersson, and I'm the culture editor of uh, Swedish daily newspaper Aftonbladet, and I have a background in journalism and politics. And I will start now by giving the floor to Jeff Mulgan, who will introduce uh, the paper, and then we'll have a discussion. So, Jeff. Over to you. How can the 2020s become a progressive decade? Bring it on. Well, thank you very much, Karen. And I will show some slides to save you having to look at my face for a few minutes, and hopefully they will work. Uh, so what the paper does, and I will give you a flavor of it very quickly, is attempt a bit of a diagnosis of where we are now and what we need to do to make the most of our moment. Uh, could you show? Uh, uh, this slide. So the, 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 the next slide sums up what has been, if you could show it, a very bad decade for us. Our sunlight was blocked out by the election of uh, some of these people, an assertive Putin, uh, uh, the loss of confidence in progress, pushing the center left into defensive positions on many, many fronts. Uh, we even have small minorities who believe a revived caliphate is the answer to the world's problems. And I put there the thoughts of Xi Jinping. Some of you may have read them. Uh, we have a China which is much more confident now in asserting an alternative to democracy and liberal democracy around the world. So this has not been a good decade. Next slide. The good news, of course, though, is that we ended the decade with lots of energy from the grassroots, energy around race, around climate, around social uh, justice. And that's why there's many people feel the next decade could be at least a, a decade where progressive values and ideas are much more influential. But it's not yet clear whether progressive parties will entirely benefit from it. And most of the energy has actually come from the movements more than from uh, the parties. So in the paper, I try and look at some of the, the realities we're dealing with. As Dominic said, we're in a, a world where the knowledge economy is completely changing the shape of our of our world with the biggest firms much more in digital and data rather than cars and steel or even banks in the past. And that means new inequalities, new challenges of policy and regulation. Next slide. We are still in a, a period where democracy is quite in battle. Half of the publics in much of the developed world really quite dissatisfied with how democracy works. And in many ways, we haven't modernized our democratic systems for a long time. Uh, next slide. And we'll come on to this shift in the global landscape. In the middle of the last century, Europe was more than a fifth of the world's population, completely dominating politically, economically, culturally. The end of this century will be down to maybe 6%, much weaker in all of those senses. And we need to learn new habits, perhaps of humility uh, and of alliance building if we're to thrive through this very different period. Next slide. Perhaps most important for progressives is this shift really in the public mind. This slide from Pew from a couple of years ago showed large majorities in many countries who've lost confidence that their children will be better off than them. And it's quite hard being progressive if people have lost confidence in that most basic side of progress. It's not true all over the world, but it's true for most of the countries involved in this event. So what do we do? In the paper, I try to start with the very concrete and just thinking about my neighbors. I live in a, a town called Luton in southern England, which used to have a, a workforce based in manufacturing of cars. It's now much more in the airport, in retail, logistics. Uh, work is much more precarious than it was a couple of generations ago. We're a much more diverse town, a third uh, Muslim. And I think all voters are much less loyal to their tribes than they were before, much more uh, up for grabs. Many of them quite like Boris Johnson, despite completely different backgrounds, uh, and uh, could well vote for many, many different parties in the next few years. And for them, 
Obviously, the key is to have programs which really address their needs in terms of jobs or elder care or pensions or transport or housing. But I think also for pretty much all of these groups who are up for grabs around the world, we need to return to the central idea of progress. And next slide. In some ways, the, the core of my argument in the paper is we've lost sight of what it means to be progressive, which is the ability to connect the short term steps, the incremental policies you're implementing now to a bigger picture of where we're headed a generation or two into the future, how societies could be better, how we could solve the problems of climate change, inequality, justice, democracy and so on. And I think we've often become managerialist, incremental and particularly in the battering from the populist right have lost that sense of imagination and progress. And next slide. I argue that in many ways we're well placed because the, the key values and insights which we inherit from the last century of progressive politics are actually very relevant to the decades ahead. The idea that all around us is a huge amount of unrealized potential in human beings, in their, their lives, their careers, their brains, their talents. The idea that security has to be the foundation of any kind of well-being or a good life. The belief in peace, and I think our, our deep hostility to war and violence and bullies, whether it's in the home and the workplace or, or globally, makes sense now. And of course, ever more, an idea of humanity as part of nature, owing obligations to nature, not separate from it. These are absolutely the right values for the 2020s and beyond. But again, it's not guaranteed we will own them because many, many other parties realize this and of course try to co-opt those values and recast their policies in those terms. In the paper, I look quite a bit at policies and programs, but I also look a bit at how we govern. And here I think there's a sort of almost an untold story of lots of new ideas in what it means to be a progressive government. New Zealand had its well-being budget, for example. Uh, I've listed there some of the emergent new ideas of how you make governments effective, agile, innovative. Uh, only a week or two ago, last week actually, the UN published its survey of use of collective intelligence methods to meet the sustainable development goals. But it's very rare to hear progressive leaders articulate a philosophy of governance, how we will do differently, things differently from the bureaucratic methods of the past. And next slide. I also in the paper look a bit at style and culture. I think one of the problems we've had in the last few years is that the populist right has been better at using social media. They've understood a world where politics is much more about performance or being interesting, not necessarily consistent, filling the space. Uh, than the centre-left, which have still, I think, not really captured what it means to compete in the social media era. And I also argue we need to reconnect with traditions of integrating politics and culture, not in the sense of culture wars. But if you look back half a century or a century, parties like the SPD really integrated their politics with the arts, theatre, music. That was largely lost in the last 20 or 30 years. And in many ways, the Greens and the Nationalists are, are much better at uh, having a cultural perspective on politics. And it's one of the reasons why Biden's inauguration was so fantastic with Amanda Gorman reminding us that actually culture should infuse every part of our politics and really demonstrate an idea of progress, which is one people might want to live in, which is full of, full of joy. And then finally, uh, I look at empathy. Uh, and in a way, this is, I think, a key issue because one of the downsides of a social media era is that we risk being trapped in our echo chamber, our bubbles, only talking to people who agree with us. So I argue we need our activists to spend time talking to people on the other side, the people who don't share our views or beliefs, understanding what it is that makes them tick. That's the only way we will get genuinely inclusive coalitions which really speak to people's hearts and minds. So I hope that gives you a flavor of the paper. I argue that now is a time where we can rebuild uh, the progressive uh, agenda, returning to values, not just pragmatic uh, technocracy, that it has to start with empathy with people's lives. It has to be realistic about the constraints of our situation, but it also has to be imaginative, 
about what could be possible a generation from now, what kind of welfare state, democracy, healthcare, net zero economy we could aspire to, and to show that that actually is something to, to want, something to care about, something to believe in. And finally, to do that with a bit of fun and lightness too, because no one wants to live in a dour and dull future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I thank you. Thanks for this presentation and for the paper. I encourage everyone to read it. It's uh, inspiring and uh, and uh, a good starting point for this for this conference. Um, I would like to ask you, maybe challenge you a bit um, on maybe you could say the starting point of the paper or your uh, fundamental view on where we are. So. Uh, when I read the paper and I listen to you, uh, you describe a situation where the role of progressives is, you could argue, more or less the same as before or as always. We should be positive about the future, build coalitions, administer improvements to people's daily lives. That's all uh, well and good. But my feeling is that part of the disconnect that you also refer to here and describe between young people and, and progressive parties today is a gap between how they perceive the world, where many, especially young people, feel a strong, very strong sense of urgency due to the climate emergency and the threats to democracy from um, the rise of right-wing populism. And they don't feel perhaps, or that's my view, that this sense of urgency is reflected back to them from, from politicians. And that creates this gap, a trust gap, where it's difficult to trust politicians who don't take the things seriously that, uh, that you feel very strongly about. So my question is, taking that into account, is your proposition um, far-reaching and critical enough? And if yes, how do we close this gap in how different groups in a progressive coalition actually uh, see the world and how, how urgent uh, and precarious the current situation is? Yeah, so I would agree with your, your analysis. And I think we're in a strange position where many perhaps older voters don't care that much about the climate. And for younger activists, this is overwhelmingly the most important issue. It's very urgent, it's very pressing, and they have a very strong sense, as in fact do I, of just how badly the world could burn up 20, 40, 60 years into the future, and that overrides everything. But I argue with young activists, they've in some ways overshot. They may be right on the threat of climate change and just how bad it could be. But compared to activists in the past, I think they've lost a sense of how much progress could be achieved in almost every other domain of life, that there is no inherent reason why we can't completely reshape, as I say, our welfare state or care for the elderly or how health is organized or how mental health is organized. In a way, this, the sheer so horror of climate change has squeezed out the space for progressive optimism about other issues. And this isn't helped by the fact that I think many of the institutions which should be working on that long-term project, universities, and I'm in one now, think tanks, political parties, their horizons have narrowed, have shrunk right back. So there's very few institutions offering us a roadmap to the future, what could be possible with, uh, with uh, the resources of a society, with growth, with new technologies, alongside urgent action to cut carbon and arrest climate change. And I think that squeezing out of a sense of the possible future actually then creates space for the populist, nationalist, authoritarians because they feed on pessimism, they feed on fatalism. That's what they need in order to, to thrive. Uh, and in a way, as I say, the central progressive institutions need to was recapture their role in offering a path to the future and qualifying what I think is sometimes the almost unrealistic pessimism of so many of our best activists um, who, as I say, have lost sense of confidence in the future. But isn't that also, I mean, so bridging that gap, I need to, I guess it needs to be a two-way, I mean, a two-way two -way, two -way discussion. It needs to be, um, uh, younger, the younger generation, there needs to be a conversation, I guess, where we also, um, um, assist existing institutions assist uh, and parties also need to listen to their concerns and, 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 and take up or um, um, and really feel and mirror back that sense of urgency. So I guess it's, I mean, it's a two-way street, 
I'm I'm thinking when I when I hear you speak to build a coalition. We maybe it's not only for the young young generation to be more uh, to take a step back. It also needs it's a, a question of um, current institutions to take a yeah step forward and be, become more mirror that sense of urgency in a better way. Yeah, and one one role possibly for leaders, especially as we come out of the COVID crisis, a crisis which has completely transformed the landscape, everything from universal basic income to industrial policy to, to health, is I would like to see more leaders using that moment for national or city conversations about what is possible 20, 30, 40 years into the future? Now, there have been some examples in the past of this being done by presidents and prime ministers and governors and mayors. And there are many methods now available for involving millions of people in such a conversation. What is likely to happen? What are our opportunities, our threats, our challenges? What could we aspire to in terms of the makeup of our cities, our schools and so on? This is a political conversation. And it has to involve the young people who more even than the old people will will live through what results. But we've had very little of that recently. Macron did it a little bit last year with his uh, uh, his, 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 his debat on climate change. But in a way, that sort of much more inclusive, energizing use of the future to create political energy in the present hasn't been seen recently. And yet I think 2022 or 21 is actually the ideal moment to do it. The polls show huge majorities in many countries wanting transformational change to their societies. That can't just be done by the technocrats. It has to be a, a more open and inclusive process. And maybe related to what you just said, I was wondering, uh a bit about how you think about conflict in politics, because in your paper you talk about consensus building and building alliances. And I was um, thinking about what the philosopher Roberto Unger, whom you also quote in your paper, has said, and uh, I'll quote him now. And he says, in a future or better or high energy democracy, there should be a principle that commands us to organize democratic politics so that it not only reflects the full range of conflict of interests and of visions in society, but also provides these clashing tendencies with the means to sharpen and develop and develop their differences. And your view seems to be a bit more about consensus building. Maybe that's a misunderstanding, but don't we need a sharpened conflict in our political space today to reveal and address the conflicts of interest also uh, inherent in capitalism and also to create better and more visionary policies? So that's definitely my instinct. And Roberto is an old collaborator and friend of mine. So I, I generally agree with him. That's why I'd encourage anyone to disagree with my paper. It's through disagreeing with it that we will get to better <laughs> results. It's why the kind of process I've described, <laughs> where a mayor or a president or a prime minister opens up a process of thinking about opportunities and challenges for 20 or 30 years, that needs to be an argument because there are lots of different contending uh, voices. So I'm absolutely at ease with that. But there's one really important rider. We have very strong evidence about who supports the authoritarian populist politics around the world, the 30 or 40 percent attracted to the Trumps and Salvinis uh, and so on. And one very clear message is that these people are, do not like complexity. <laughs> They are scared in a way of the pace of change and the complexity, and they want in some ways simpler narratives. And the sort of complexity and ambiguity which makes sense for very metropolitan, highly educated elites actually doesn't work so well for everyone and can create more political space for the other side. So that's my one qualification uh, to, to what you've said. So um, I would also uh, like to ask you, you say in the paper that the COVID crisis should have made things easier um, for progressives. And that's, I mean, it's the return of the state. It's this, it's the threat that a common threat, the common enemy. It's the need for um, collaboration on a global and a national scale. But how, in your view, did, did we do? <laughs> how did progressives do? Did we catch the moment? And uh, if not, why? Well, I think that this, is, this has happened many times in history. Uh, in the 19th century, the SPD in Germany, you know, promoted social democratic ideas, but it was Bismarck who created the welfare uh, state. Uh, in Britain, it was the, the Liberals, not the Labour Party, who first introduced things like pensions. Uh, 
And in my country now, we're in this remarkable situation where Boris Johnson, with a large conservative majority, is talking about radical leveling up of regional inequalities. Uh, he has massively increased public spending. He has introduced uh, essentially not quite a universal basic income, but something not so far from it. And is talking about you know quite demanding decarbonization targets. So I think the lesson of history is that there are big tides of ideas, and the tide, I think, at the moment is very much moving in a progressive direction at every level. But it's not always the parties who were the initiators of those ideas who benefit, because anyone can, uh, and conservative parties are often very nimble and agile in co-opting the other side's ideas because their main interest is in keeping power. And our Conservative Party here is brilliant at keeping power. And to be honest, our Labour Party hasn't known how to respond at all. Um, I also would like to challenge you a bit maybe uh, on another part of the paper. And you say that there's a risk now for progressive parties being stuck. And this is connected to your idea of reinvigorating democracy and trying to um, think about innovation in, 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 in policy making. But you say there's a risk for progressive parties that they become stuck in just seeing more public spending as inherently good or a sign of being a progressive. But isn't there a case right now at this moment to really challenge austerity orthodoxy and the shortcomings after the financial crisis and also the massive mass investments that will be needed to combat the climate crisis and readjust our societies isn't isn't it the right fight to 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 wager yeah in the short run it's got to be right to, to to spend a lot and what the biden administration is doing is very exciting and will open up all sorts of uh, of opportunities and has already had dramatic effects on 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 poverty uh, in really impressive ways but i think it's disastrous for progressives to become believers in government as an end in itself or more spending as good uh, in itself. It isn't. Uh, and from the public's point of view, you know, government is good if it does good services and you get good value. But no normal citizen thinks more government is inherently a good thing. More bureaucrats, larger programs, higher taxes. It all depends on what you do with it. And that's why this the innovation agenda around how government works, how it uses things, how it uses technology, how it's frugal rather than wasteful is so important. And I think we, we really risk in a few years time, if we don't attend to this now, um, being blamed for overspending, inefficiency, waste, uh, you know, flabby bureaucracies, uh, which then the public turns uh, against. And this is why Always the best fruit is to be very energetic on public spending where it's needed, but equally energetic on how that money will be spent, ensuring it's transparent, accountable, innovative, uh, and so on. And I have a bit of a fear now that we're returning to a little bit what there was 30, 40 years ago, a belief in government as good in itself, or indeed regulation as good in itself. They're, they're not, and common sense should tell us that. So we will soon um, move to the global politics part of your paper and with Dr. Jan Cortel. But just one last question before that. And I find it's very interesting in your paper, you try to define issues or uh, um, maybe new measures or uh, policy goals that are um, more connected to, to the moment and to the, the also way to innovate in, policies, in policy. And you say, for example, that mental health could be um, an area to create policies around as a starting point for a discussion on, I guess, a good life, what you were talking about, how society should look like 20 years from now. And could you talk a, a bit about that? How could we create uh, policies around, around uh, mental health and how, how would that transform politics? Well, this is just one example where I think our yeah. whole landscape yeah. has changed. And the COVID crisis has cast much more attention onto isolation, anxiety, depression. Uh, the, the IPO project I'm part of, which is the International Public Policy Observatory, we've looked globally at what's happened to the trends for school kids, for people in care homes in terms of mental health. When the sort of social democratic project sort of really took shape uh, 50, 80 years ago, whenever you like to think about it, it was entirely focused on physical health. That was what you needed, hospitals and doctors. Well, it was kind of assumed mental health was looked after 
by the individual or the family or the community. But I think now we're in a quite different world where it is not obvious that mental health should be so much the poor cousin of physical health. And I think the public get this. And some countries like New Zealand with its well-being budget are significantly increasing spending, not just on acute mental health care, but also population level ones. I've just today actually sort of tweeted a, a fascinating randomized control trial of a, of a, of a service I was involved in designing through a thing called Action for Happiness, which provides community level uh, mental health support with extraordinarily strong uh, 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 results. And I think increasingly we will see well-being as one of the primary goals of policy. Again, New Zealand is doing this, Finland, other countries are taking it seriously. And it means that you look at a welfare state and security through quite different lenses where issues like isolation and loneliness become as important as you know ensuring that if you break your leg, you get it fixed. Uh, and I think this is progressive in every sense. It's progressive because it is about progress but it also goes with the direction of change of culture. And if you read newspapers and magazines or what people talk about in their private life, they actually probably talk more about mental health than about physical health. Yet all of our systems and structures have lagged far behind uh, in this respect. My hope is the COVID crisis has contributed to a step change. And just as a final example, we, we've had on our evening news in the last year, for the first time I can ever remember, the national statistical data on changing levels of anxiety and depression and treating that as, as important perhaps as what's happened to GDP or numbers of jobs. This has to be progress, but it's one of many, many fields where if we were reinventing welfare now from the needs of the present, it would be different from the welfare state we inherited from the last century. Um, I think that's certainly true, and we'll see if we have time left uh, to circle back to this discussion. But um, I would like now like to uh, invite Dr. Janka Ertel, um, since part of the action paper deals with global politics and the shrinking weight of Euro politically, socially, and economically in the world. And uh, Janka, uh, would you like to comment on that part of the paper, please? Yeah, I would love to. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. And I think it's really an important point that, that Jeff hasn't been able to speak about much of the presentation, uh, but he raises it very prominently in the paper. That's the geopolitical dimension of the progressive future and the importance of growing kind of new coalitions. We find ourselves at a pretty historic moment. And I think it is important to show how all of these issues that have just been raised do translate into a global narrative. As Dominic pointed out, um, as we speak right now, the preparations for the G7 meeting in Cornwall are well underway, and Joe Biden will shortly arrive in Europe for his first trip as president. Biden stands for a progressive agenda that goes much further than a linear continuation of the Obama era, and he's coming to Europe with a very clear message. Here in Europe, this message is consistently framed as trying to marshal support for his policies on China. But this framing misses a significant part of the picture. His approach is not about a new Cold War struggle of defending U.S. supremacy against China's rise. It is not about keeping China down to preserve U.S. dominance, but it is about actively shaping a world in which we still have the option to do so, to actually shape. Um, and I, I think it's about a new approach that takes the fact that China is so significantly changing the game across the entirety of policy areas that takes that actually seriously. As Jake Sullivan and Jennifer Harris from the U.S. National Security Council put it nicely before taking office, U.S. foreign policymakers now face a world in which power is increasingly measured and exercised in economic terms, where authoritarian capitalism is challenging market democracy as the prevailing model. And they acknowledge that this shift in grand strategy necessitates a rethink of economic philosophy that has thus far driven U.S. policy. And I think it's precisely in this context that the framing of Biden just trying to get Europe on board on China is missing how much of an opportunity the current dynamic presents for Europe and for a progressive agenda. An agenda that transcends the traditional idea of the West and forges new global coalitions. The fact that Australia, India, South Korea and South Africa have been invited as guests to the G7 meeting being a case in point here. So let me make the case in three minutes why it is right to refract our thinking through the challenges that Xi Jinping's version of China poses on tech, on climate, on prosperity, and therefore also on the resilience of democracy. 
and why only a positive, non-defensive agenda that embraces change and protects the possibility of progress will be able to tackle this new reality of a China that is now clearly set on disintegrating from global markets and standards, focused on setting its own terms of how the world economy should deliver for China. So on tech, there's already this illusion of China's unbeatable market power, that scale and the amount of data will provide it with the edge to lead the digital transformation. China is still very far away from where it would need to be to be autonomous in this area. And this provides the US and Europe with leverage. If pursued jointly or in a coordinated way, we still have and will continue to be able to provide competitive solutions. But we need to invest in standard setting, gaining global market shares through digital connectivity, in joint R&D and smart industrial policy. The best case scenario on issues like 5 or 6G are global standards. The worst case scenario is a fragmentation of the democratic tech powers. This is how we lose the scale we need to compete and shape the digital future in a democratic and inclusive way. On climate, it will mean to actively embrace the competitive dynamics of the decarbonization logic that is now entering the markets and to shape the standards by which this is happening. It is key to forge coalitions with banks and investors, spend on renewable energy solutions globally by providing fiscal space in climate vulnerable countries and seizing this as an active part of the development agenda. It also means breaking down traditional inter-institutional barriers and stop being shy about connecting industrial policy and a development agenda that supports the green transition. And finally, on prosperity, it will mean to retell the story of wealth creation in a post-neoliberal world. This will include reining in the worst instincts of our own companies doing business in China while actively spending political capital on creating alternative markets in key growth regions of the Indo-Pacific. There is a clear realization, even in the conservative chambers of the German industry, that it's impossible for, market, for the market and companies to take care of the imbalances that stake back Chinese competitors create. That the challenge is structural and will require a structural, not a market response. And this provides space for progressive ideas and a perceptive ground for a positive role of government in creating a more level uh, playing field globally for long-term prosperity and job security at home. We will not have the luxury to figure out our own post-COVID recovery, digital and green transformation in isolation from this larger challenge. We have to do sort of both things simultaneously and seize the opportunity that China presents us with of reshaping the way we approach politics and economics. The logic is not to win a new Cold War, but to use the current momentum to build a better world that delivers for all and not just for China and some big companies. So I think it kind of this element of the conversation really ties in nicely with the what do we do on the national level really translates well to the kind of global level as well. So, um, Jeff, would you like to comment? You talk in your paper about also the necessity to think about to think ahead when it comes to um to to uh, when you think about geopolitics and think about how could global governance look not just today or next year but maybe 10 or 20 years ahead would you like to uh, comment on on what uh, Janka just said and also say a bit more about what's in your paper uh, about uh, global policies yeah I, I agree with everything Janka just said in, in the paper, I really take sort of two angles. One is the question of what might we want to invent in terms of global multilateral institutions now that we have a Joe Biden and a White House. Uh, and if we were inventing the UN system today, it would again look very different from the 1940s. Then central institutions were around money, a World Bank, an international monetary fund. And the weird thing, as Yanka said, is we now in an economy dominated by data, and knowledge and platforms, yet there is almost no global governance of data, of artificial intelligence, of cybersecurity, any of those things, and all sorts of problems flow from that. And I would like to see the, the powers of the world <laughs> thinking about and designing new uh, global governance institutions so that we can you know, have a, a cyberspace which actually serves uh, everyone. And I think it's possible that China will buy into that. There's all sorts of complexities. But that is where genuinely global multilateral institutions are possible, as I hope there will be on tax and on other things like biodiversity and perhaps next stages of decarbonization. There are other issues, though, as Yanka said, where we should expect a lot more conflict <laughs> in the future uh, and where we will be rubbing up against assertive 
Russia, uh, a, a more assertive, probably more nationalistic China. Uh, and that's where I think the big question for progressive governments is whether they are willing to actually uh, uh, make sacrifice material interests in order to, to fight against essentially bullying by uh, uh, other powers around the world. And that's where we will need new coalitions of values, which as Yanka said, is not like a return to the Cold War, but it's about taking seriously, you know, our values of freedom, equity, seriousness on the climate and being willing to actually uh, uh, fight for them and not just seeing things through a purely sort of realist national interest point of view, which is often how we have uh, dealt with China in the past. So I think it's quite a you know a complicated landscape and I hope we can do both at once, both simultaneously, both a new vision of global governance. And as I point out in the paper, five years before the UN was created, it looked completely impossible. So there's a kind of, we, we, we mustn't be trapped by a sort of wrong kind of realism into underestimating what's possible, but we also need to be willing to uh, sort of put our money where our mouth is on values too. Could you also, Janka, maybe um, say some, a bit more about what the potential pitfalls could be for a, a progressive co coalition uh, with regards to these issues? Is it, the, uh, is, it, is it the realism? Is it the inability to step away from short term, I don't know, realism or economic gains? Or is that the main obstacle or what's, could you yeah, elaborate on that a bit? I see a main problem at the moment in Europe uh, and in hesitance and inertia. Uh, and I sit in Berlin um, and I, I can tell you this is kind of a waiting period that we're having at the moment. So what's going to come in the fall? What is going to happen next? And I see a problem in this kind of being not in sync that the Biden administration needs to deliver also at home on this agenda, on this global approach, on a multilateral approach, on taking the allies on board, and that it is becoming slightly difficult at the moment because there is a kind of hedginess in Paris in Berlin. I think we've seen that in the multiple speeches that we've been hearing since the Biden administration has been in office, that they're not entirely sure whether they are fully going to buy into this, whether there is going to be a real new coalition to be built at the moment. And this hesitance can have a detrimental effect on what is actually on kind of dampening the opportunities that are actually there in this huge window of opportunity where the sameness of the analytical um, challenge that we're facing, we agree on what the problems are very much at the moment. And the change that has happened in the United States that is actually bringing it so much closer to European positions on data, on data privacy, um, on trade questions. You know, there's a lot more similarities now, but these are, they're kind of, um, there's a risk that they fall by the wayside in our own hesitance on what may come in three and a half years, whether there is going to be a next Trump on the horizon. And I think what the, the challenge for us is right now to understand that we have to seize these next 3.5 years, three and a half years that we have as good as we can, um, because it's not there, the, the, the global challenge that we're going to see on the bigger stage um, is going to move with the same speed that it has in the past. And that's going to create even bigger challenges. So losing this momentum, losing this window of opportunity will not leave us in a better place in four years time, come what may in the US elections then. Um, and what would you say issue-wise are the main obstacles then for Europe and US to come together? Is it the view of market, digital markets or um, what's the, what, are, what are we uh, fight, struggling against? So I think at the moment from a Berlin perspective, it is obviously that there is a great degree of skepticism when it comes to the developments in China. But there is no kind of willingness to buy into a decoupling agenda. There's no willingness to say, you know, to go into an adversarial mode because there is a lot of economic interest and there's a lot of jobs tied to this. Um, there is a lot of kind of uh, the, the, the idea of how our progress and how our future should look like um, from the current German government is very much tied to the China experience. So there, this is definitely dampening some of the expectations. Um, the data questions are, I think, re they are real, but they can also be overcome. Um, I think we have a number of issues that we're also kind of blowing up out of proportion a bit in terms of how big of a problem they could actually be um, if we were to sit down and negotiate about them. Um, the trade question is going to be an issue. Um, I think there are a lot of offers being made by the US at the moment in terms of the use of economic coercion and the use of uh, weaponization of its own economy, of the use of sanctions to actually extend a hand to the Europeans. Um, but there is reluctance on issues like defense spending on Nord Stream 2. I mean, we know the issues. They've been there for so long. 
I do think it's important, though, to transcend that and to look at the larger challenge that we're facing for, for the years to come. Thank you, Janka. So um, I have a last uh, question for for um, for Jeff. So, or do you want to say something more, or do you want to comment on what Janka just just said, Jeff? Sorry. Well, I wanted to make one comment, which I think, in a way, is the challenge for everyone on this event and <laughs> for all of us collectively. And it's really how we cultivate a double mind. On the one hand, as Janka was saying, you know, you need to be realistic about the details and the conflicts around trade negotiations or, or politics and so on. And there's no point being unrealistic. But I think it's also just as important to cultivate imagination and ideas, a sense of what might be possible 10 or 20 years from now, which isn't possible now. And I think that in international affairs, as in domestic ones, we've lost a lot of that imagination. There aren't enough people working on possibilities, designing a future UN, future environmental governance, how we would manage data flows in 2030, 2040. That's almost disappeared. It's not done in the universities, the parties, the think tanks, and therefore we're squeezed back to a, often an excessive realism. And the whole point of radical politics is you make new things possible, which at the time weren't possible. And if we're going to re-inspire people with a sense of the progressive possibility, we need the best minds working on that longer horizon, as well as being very smart and realistic about the constraints of the present. I, from my, uh, from my side, I really agree with that. And it's interesting just when we, what we heard in the introduction with the, the new agreement on the global minimum corporate tax rate. I mean, that's a, a, that's a proposition that came up I mean, it's years ago now that Piketty and Sukman started to uh, presenting this idea, which seemed impossible and, and like crazy visionary at the time. And now they are close to becoming uh, policy. So that's interesting. Uh, I would like to ask you, Je Jeff, a last question. So your last chapter in the paper, you talk about the age of digital media, personality, style and, and culture. And you say progressive pol politicians and movements need to better uh, make use of the new uh, public sphere of the new um, uh, how that's constructed, but isn't it also the case that uh, the digital digital sphere today is uh, in many ways constructed in a way that promotes the type of messages that we are antithetical to um, rage, uh, anger, those type kinds of emotions seems like the perfect fit for how social media works today, just in terms of how the business model works. So how should we think about, it seems, uh, seems to me that we need uh, policies for both maybe regulating um, uh, social media and the, how, how uh, the public sphere is constructed, but also we, we need, as you say, short-term strategies for how to deal with the reality that's that we live with. So could you say a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, this is a big and difficult issue, and yeah. I don't pretend to have all the answers. My instinct is we will need to move towards new laws, which do regulate mm -hmm. truth and lying in quite different ways on social media, although that will take some time and will be very uh, resisted. Uh, but just in terms of political practice, um, as I said, I think politics has become much more performative. Um, we know that there are the algorithms do, as you say, support rage and polarization, particularly within the progressive movement. I think we particularly suffer from creating internal battles over all sorts of topics driven by the algorithms. But for politicians, I think they just need to learn new styles of being interesting, being colorful, opening up their lives. I you know, worked in, in politics through the 90s and 2000s when exactly opposite method was imposed, very disciplined, very tightly controlled by party headquarters. And that did work at a certain moment, but it just doesn't work now. It makes politics boring and it leaves a huge space for the populist right to fill up in weird, inconsistent, crazy ways. But people are talking about them and they, they engage. So uh, I, I, sus I suspect we do need to cultivate different kinds of perhaps more angular, problematic, complicated personalities as part of how any party presents itself. And that will sometimes mean being a bit less disciplined, a bit less consistent. Uh, but that is the era we are in. This is in part theatre and performance as well as policy and tax and all those other things.
So I think that's a good place to uh, end this conversation. We have, uh, I mean, this is the agenda, it's the geopolitics, it's the style, it's the vision, it's the uh, the climate crisis, it's all there. So I'm um, looking forward to uh, two days of um, dealing with the issues you've laid out, Jeff, and trying to uh, get a bit further ahead uh, in solutions, um, or at least visions. So thank you so much both of you for this inspiring um, conversation. Looking forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.